Welcome back to chapter six, where we're talking about telescopes. In this video, although it looks like we're covering a lot of different sections out of chapter six, we're actually just going to go through the highlights of the chapter and not going into all of the details that are in each of those sections. So one of the most important things to consider for any telescope are some of the questions that we might ask ourselves if we're trying to build a new one. So first of all, when we design a telescope, we have to know what kind of light it's going to detect because that will affect the design of the overall telescope. We also want to know if it's going to use lenses or mirrors. And as we talked about in the previous video, um, if it's a historic telescope, it's very possible that it is a refracting telescope that uses lenses. But moving forward since the 1900s, we build um, reflecting telescopes, either with mirrors, if they are visible light telescopes or um, similar wavelengths, or with dishes, um, so radio dishes or satellite dishes would, use, uh, would be used for those long wavelengths because the overall structure of the telescope is the same, a curved surface for that type of light to bounce off of, but long wavelengths don't actually need the shiny surfaces that shorter wavelengths do. We also want to know how the telescope gets the light from um, the front of the telescope tube to the instruments or detectors or the eyepiece if you're just trying to look through the telescope. And we learned a couple of terms very briefly in the previous video, Newtonian focus compared to Cassegrain focus, that aren't essential to our curriculum, but it's worth recognizing if you're looking up information about a particular telescope, if you see those kinds of terms, it's telling us how that light is being manipulated within the telescope tube. And then the single most important question to ask about a new telescope that we're building is how big is that telescope? because we're gonna talk about three different powers that a telescope has and every single one of them cares about the overall size of the telescope and bigger is always better. So the first big telescope power that um, makes it why we want telescopes and not just looking at things with our eyes is because telescopes are larger across than our eyes are and so they are able to collect more light. Even if we are just talking about a telescope that is collecting regular visible light that our eyes would see, the bigger it is across, the more light it will gather, and the more light that we gather, the fainter objects that we can see. This is a similar concept, not identical, but a similar concept to leaving a shutter open when you're taking a picture at night. You will collect more light over that time frame than if you just took a very quick picture. But by having a wider telescope, you're collecting more light every single second. Kind of like if there was a rainstorm and you set out a small coffee cup, so small across, small diameter, and a really wide pan, big diameter, large across. The wide pan would be able to collect more rain every second, and you'd be able to collect more overall. The second power that a telescope has is to be able to distinguish small details and structure that our eyes wouldn't be able to pick up. This is considered resolving power and it is based on the wavelength of light being used and the diameter of the telescope. There is an equation in the book if you're interested in looking at it, but one of the ways that we can think about it, especially living in this digital age, is if we imagine having a photograph or a diagram that is really low resolution in a computer sense, that means that each pixel is actually kind of big and we don't have a lot of small details or structure. If we have a really high resolution image, it means the pixel size is really small and we can get really fine details. The better resolution we have, whether it is for a telescope and the scientific way of thinking about resolving power, or for a photograph and the computer way of thinking about resolving power, the better resolution, it means the smaller details that we're actually able to distinguish. What's really important for telescopes though, is Earth's atmosphere actually prevents us from having perfect resolution. No matter how good our telescope is, if it's on the ground, it has to look through all of Earth's atmosphere. 
And even if it looks like a clear evening, if the air is really turbulent, there's a lot of wind and it's moving around, or it's really humid and there's a lot of water molecules, it will actually affect how good we can see small details. We will still collect the light so that first power won't be affected, but that picture is going to look blurry to us in a sense. Adaptive optics is something that is described in the textbook in this chapter if you're interested in learning more, and it is a way that astronomers are able to somewhat fix this issue of seeing, the resolving limit um, through Earth's atmosphere. The other thing we can do to try to fix it is just to put our telescopes really high on mountaintops so there's physically less air to have to look through. And then the third power that a telescope has is we can enlarge an image and see it bigger than our eyes would be able to. This is limited by the shape and the diameter of um, both the primary lens or mirror and the eyepiece that you're using. And once again, bigger is better for that. However, this is the least important of the three telescope powers because if you have a dim image or a blurry image, it will not help you to zoom in on that dim or blurry image. When we have TV shows that see like two pixels of a license plate and when they zoom and enhance, all of a sudden we have a seven digit license plate number, that's just movie magic. That, isn't, that doesn't exist in the real world. Magnifying power is kind of useless if you don't already have good enough light gathering power and resolution. Now, the other thing to consider, especially for ground-based telescopes, is some of the factors involved once we've decided how big a telescope we have a budget for, what kind of light it's going to see, that kind of thing, is we have to figure out where to put it. Now, weather is a major concern. We would not actually want to build a multi-million dollar telescope here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, because it's cloudy a lot and it snows a lot. So we want a drier site. Deserts are a really good place to build telescopes because the weather is consistent and stable. Seeing is that phrase we talked about when we talked about resolution and re resolving power. By having less air between us and all of the astronomical objects that we're looking at, we'll get better resolution than we would if we were low down at low alt uh, altitudes, elevations. And then city lights. This is becoming more and more of a problem over time. Light pollution is a significant issue in astronomy. Light from nearby cities can kind of bounce off the um, atmosphere, not just if there's clouds, and it will actually affect our ability to see objects because they're being washed out by this light pollution. This set of pictures shows us just how big a difference this can be so this is a pair of images taken by Jeremy Stanley in a um, suburb of a major city as well as further out in the country. And you can see the difference. So it is roughly the same um, conditions otherwise, except for the light pollution. And in the left image, we can see one bright star and maybe a couple of other stars if we look carefully. And on the right image, we can actually see the Milky Way, the disk of our galaxy in the background. The biggest issue for modern astronomy is light pollution. We will have um, the video, the black marble, in the playlist for this um, module. But it, it shows us the Earth at night and all of the different light that we can see from space. So in images like this. If we are able to see these lights from space, what that means is that's light that wasn't actually being used to be helpful at night. It is really important for safety to have lights outdoors at nighttime. But if those lights shine straight up into the sky, that's wasted electricity. So we're wasting that resource and we are polluting our skies with that wasted light. So something to consider. On the left, we can see even without labels of any kind that we're looking at the United States. And on the right, again, even without labels, we can see that we are looking at Lake Michigan and the state of Michigan, at least the lower peninsula. And we can even pick out places like Chicago and Detroit and Grand Rapids because they are sources of more people and more lights outside. And so they create more light pollution. Okay, so 
Earth's atmosphere existing, it does a good thing to protect us from gamma rays and x-rays while we're living here on the ground, but it causes poor resolving power, it causes light pollution when we are trying to use a ground-based telescope, and so why aren't we putting all of our scientific observatories up into space? The single most um, obvious answer to us is that it is really, really expensive to put things into space. It is also true as a secondary that um, if anything breaks on a ground-based telescope, we can fix it quite easily. If something breaks on a spacecraft, it is very difficult to schedule a way to, to fix it. The Hubble Space Telescope had several different missions to, um, to work on it, to improve it, and to fix it, uh, but that was using the Space Shuttle program, which we don't even have at this current time. Okay, so thinking about the picture that we saw before, and you can go back to it if you need to, that's what rewind is for, out of the list provided to us here, which of the following wavelengths can be observed most easily by a telescope on Earth's surface? So a pause and think question for us. Pause as long as you need to. All right, so with these options, we note, first of all, that visible light would have been an obvious choice for us, but I didn't list it. The fact that we can see the sun and the moon and the stars tells us that visible light can make it through Earth's atmosphere. But once that's taken away from us as an option, the only other reasonable option here would be a radio telescope. Now, if we consider that then, that radio waves and visible light are the only things that make it down to the surface, what then would be the best out of these four options given to us? Which of these would be the best to support building? So another pause and think question for us. Maybe pause a little bit longer, think a little bit deeper. All right, as we read through our options, we see that there are two that are space-based, a radio telescope in space or an ultraviolet telescope in space. And there are two that are ground-based. No x-rays make it all the way down to the surface. So option three is completely out. If we tried to build that, it would not see anything at all. Most infrared light is also blocked by our atmosphere. And so building an infrared telescope in a place that's low elevation is also not a good idea because it won't see very much. It will effectively be a visible light telescope with a little bit of near infrared. And that's not going to be a good choice for us. So if we look at the two space-based observatories then, radio and ultraviolet, we might recognize that the big difference is that radio is something we can do on the ground, ultraviolet we cannot. So the best option here would be option two because it is a type of light that we cannot easily study from the ground, and so it is worth putting into space. We have several different ultraviolet telescopes in orbit around Earth, we actually don't put any radio telescopes in orbit around Earth because they do such a good job on the ground um, that we would prefer to have them be accessible and fixable on the ground here on Earth because with radio telescopes, light pollution is not as big a problem and the seeing limit, the resolution limit, is not as big a problem for radio as it is for visible. It is also important to recognize that when we start to think about space-based observatories, we are putting things into space to be able to go beyond visible wavelength telescopes on the ground and radio wavelength telescopes on the ground. Because all these other forms of light require us to be able to put things into space. This set of images is showing us the constellation Orion, the patch of sky that we call Orion, as well as kind of a connect the dots of the brighter stars. And we see in visible light that we see a lot of stars in that area, as well as a brighter patch um, in the bottom portion that is Orion's nebula. In the middle picture, this is x-rays. There are really bright sources showing in the x-ray picture that don't even show up in the visible light. And then there's infrared radiation, which shows us in the same place where we can see the Orion Nebula in picture A, 
there's a really bright area of gas and dust that is showing up in infrared because infrared, which humans make because we are warm but not hot like stars, is also what gas and dust can make when it is warm but not hot. And so infrared is able to show us where we see lots of gas and dust, and to study it, we really do need to put things into space. Additionally, if we want a better resolution because of the limits of seeing and light pollution, then we need to put things into space even if they do use visible light. I said that radio telescopes do a really good job on the ground. We don't need to put those into space. But there's so many problems with visible light telescopes on the ground that we do want a couple of really, really good spacecraft that can still observe in those wavelengths. Hubble Space Telescope is the most famous of those. And I urge you to click on the link here that shows us the um, Hubble Extreme Deep Field, which is also described in our textbook. And the last couple of slides that I want to cover in this um, chapter is just making sure we have a bigger picture view of what telescopes can do beyond taking pretty pictures. Telescopes can measure the spectrum from a star by taking that light received and rather than making it a picture of that area of the sky, collecting all of the light and then making a spectral curve or a set of spectral lines. Astronomers more often are looking at the spectrum of an object than the image of an object because there's a lot more to learn using that spectra. We talked about spectroscopy in chapter five, and if you're still feeling a little bit fuzzy on that topic, I urge you to go back, especially to the section um, 5.3, um, the video and the textbook. It's also worth recognizing that telescopes can do more than just deal with light. They can see things beyond just the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum, all of the different types of light from gamma rays down to radio waves, we talked about in the first chapter um, five video. But the three things listed here were never mentioned in that video, and that's because they aren't light. Gravitational waves are basically ripples in the fabric of space-time, and it requires a really weird and different and interesting structure of telescope to be able to detect those. You can search LIGO, L-I-G-O, to see what that looks like, and it's a new piece of um, astronomy that we'll be able to talk about a little bit towards the end of this semester, um, and I'm always happy to answer questions in the discussions. Neutrinos, we are going to learn all about in chapter 16. We will learn about what neutrino telescopes do and what they're actually observing. But neutrinos are a particle, not a form of light. They aren't photons. And then cosmic rays. Although we don't really talk about them in our particular curriculum, I wanted to mention them because if you've ever heard the phrase cosmic rays, then you might think that that's like gamma rays or x-rays, that it's a form of light, but it is not. Instead, they're actually highly energetic protons. They're moving very, very quickly from sources outside the solar system, and they can be detected um, using our technology. It is worth recognizing that we tend to try to build our telescopes as big as possible for those telescope powers, light gathering, resolution, and magnification. But that doesn't necessarily mean scaling a single lens or mirror up. If we look at all of these different pictures, what we start to recognize is that several of them have this kind of honeycomb pattern. Those are optical telescopes that are using segmented mirrors, many different mirrors that all add up to make a larger overall um, collecting area. Radio telescopes do something slightly similar. They use um, radio arrays, so a bunch of separate satellite dishes or radio dishes that are then connected by computer. And by comparing two different um, radio telescopes within the array, we can actually do something called interferometry and treat the array as having the resolution of the full distance between two different radio dishes. If that doesn't quite make sense, that's okay. It's not fully part of our um, key curriculum, and you can read in the textbook if you're interested in a, a little bit more about interferometry, but most of the details of it are outside the scope of an introductory astronomy course, and so I want to mention it, 
but don't feel bad if it doesn't quite make sense to us. So I'm going to leave us with a couple of links that give us a couple of um, great websites for astronomy images so we can start to see what telescopes are capable of doing. And it's worth recognizing that just as always, we will have follow-up um, activities to talk through some of these new terms in chapter six, although there's less in this chapter that involves critical thinking as much as it does just processing this new knowledge um, that we're gaining. So I'm always happy to answer questions, but this is the end of the module that contains chapters five and six. Thank you for watching.